four different directions in the last three days. So I'm not quite sure where it's going to end up today. So we're going we're gonna to see what the Lord has for us. Uh, this morning we are going to the Gospel according to Mark, uh, reading from the second chapter, verses 23, and then continuing on in chapter 3 to verse 6. This is the Word of God. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for the priest to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Another time he went into the synagogue and a man with his shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. And Jesus said to the man with a shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and, deaf and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Here is reading God's holy word. May I add a blessing to all that have ears to hear. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we have come to this place. Open our hearts and open our minds to what you may have to say for us this day. That we may learn and grow and come closer to you as we approach your communion table. This I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now this story that we read in Mark has two controversial stories. We see the first where Jesus' disciples are walking along on the Sabbath. And their stomachs begin to growl. Like most of us do, right? When we get hungry. And so they reach down and they pluck some grains of wheat, barley, whatever it is. And they take the husk off of them and they pop them in their mouth. Now, what they did was not illegal. Because it was in Judean law that the corners of the fields would be left. So that sojourners along the route could, if they got hungry, they could pull and, and eat. It was a, kind of a hospitality kind of deal. So what they did was not illegal. They were not stealing. But the Pharisees happen to be there. Why they're there, we don't know. Mark doesn't tell us. But the Pharisees watched the disciples pluck those grain, heads of grain off that, that plant. And in that moment, they seize the opportunity to question Jesus. See, it wasn't an illegal act that they were concerned about, it was breaking the law of the Sabbath. What is the law of the Sabbath? It started with God. That's a pretty good place to start, isn't it? And normally all things start with God. And so too this started with God. God created the world in how many days? Six, Six days. And what did he do on the Sabbath? He rested. But what else did he do? 
He appreciated what he'd done for six days, absolutely. He, he sat back and he says, man, this is a, I did a really good job. And so he appreciated what he had created, what God had created in those six days. And because it's God created, it's holy. The Jewish folks considered that Sabbath day holy. Now what had happened is the Israelites weren't really good at, at going in a straight path to follow God. They would get off uh, and do their own thing and, and they would be defeated by many different countries, Babylonians, and they would be carted off there. To, and so they were not good at obeying the law that Moses had given them. Part of that concerning the law, the Sabbath. They were not resting. They were not keeping it holy. They were not taking that opportunity that God had given them to praise God. To connect with God. To put aside all the busyness of the world and have that moment with God. And so, if, if we as humans aren't uh, obeying one law, what do we normally do? We create more laws to make sure that we're obeying the initial law, right? And that's exactly what the Pharisees had done. They had created this, all these laws around the Sabbath, and they had, they had even defined what work looked like. The third one on their list was harvesting of grain. And that's the one that the Pharisees were concerned about when the disciples plucked that grain because they were doing work. And the Pharisees come and they, they confront Jesus. And they say, Jesus, why are the folks that follow you working on the Sabbath? Don't you know the laws of the Sabbath? Don't you know it's a day of rest? Don't you know that you're not supposed to be working this day? They felt that they should have been stayed put on that day and prepared their meals ahead of time. What the Pharisees were doing there in the field along the side of them is, an, is another question for another time. But the Pharisees confront Jesus. And Jesus replies. I have to make sure that I get this quote right. <clears throat> have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? Jesus brings back a legal issue, a legal answer to what the Pharisees had asked him. By bringing David into the picture, the Pharisees had to acknowledge what David had done. David was running away from Saul. And Saul is pursuing him and he and his companions that are with David uh, have gone several days and they come to the temple and they were hungry. And so David went in and ate the bread that was only for the priests. And he did that because it had been created to preserve the life of another. David took that so that he could be sustained, that his life could be saved, and he can continue on. So the Pharisees don't really know how to react now to what Jesus just did. You see, he, he took a piece of the law and brought it forward and made it new. 
Because that's what Jesus is all about. Making it new. And so, they continue on. Whether it's the same day or another Sabbath, it, uh, it's not, not well de defined in the, in the scripture, but it doesn't matter if it's the same day or a different day. Jesus approaches a temple, which is Jesus' normal thing to do on a Sabbath, to come and, and praise. And so he enters the temple. There, there was a man, and his hand was withered. I'm going to say it's, he was a right-handed guy, and it was his right hand that was withered. And I'm saying that because if it was my right hand that I couldn't use, I would be almost worthless. Because I don't do well with my left hand. So I would be only half good. Could I make a living with only my left hand? Maybe today with computers and such, but in Jesus' day, a one-handed person was limited to what was available to provide for his family. On this Sabbath day that the man is in the temple, is his earthly life, his bodily life in danger? No. A withered hand he's had for a while. And tomorrow or today, the man's not going to die from that withered hand. Remember that. And the Pharisees were watching. <laughs> when we enter this place, what are we to do? To pray to worship. But what did the Pharisees do that day? Accuse. They came to catch him. They didn't enter the temple with any good thoughts. They came purely to watch what Jesus would do so they could accuse him of wrongdoing. So they could put his name in the mud, stomp it around, and be rid of him. Jesus knows all things, right? He knows the thoughts before we know our thoughts. And, and so he saw the man with a withered hand. He says, stand up. Jesus wanted everybody to see. He wanted everybody to see because there was going to be a, a real big difference today. So he wanted, he wanted everyone to be watching. So he said, stand up. And then looking at the Pharisees, he says, which is, what, what do we do on the Sabbath? Is it, is it right to heal or wrong to heal? Is it, is it the right thing to, to save this man's arm on, on to Sabbath day? And he says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You see, the Sabbath had been given as a gift. A gift from God. A, a day that we could sit still and be quiet. And in that quietness, come closer to God and appreciate what God had given us. Because that's what we do when we give praise, right? We appreciate what God has done for us this week and this day and this year. And we offer that praise. Oh, I lost my train of thought. The Pharisees had made the Sabbath a burden. No longer was it a gift from God. No, one, no longer was it a day that to, to connect, but it was a day to avoid all kinds of things. 
and it became a burden because you had to prepare everything the day before. You couldn't go here, you couldn't go there, you couldn't do this, you couldn't do that. So it became a burden and not a gift. Jesus says, <clears throat> is it better to do good or to do evil? If I heal this man's arm, if I take away that withered, that deficiency in that hand, is it good or is it evil? You see, the law was okay. The law had its purpose. But Jesus understood that man had created law for their own purpose. And in that, they had lost the intent of the law. And that's what Jesus came for. To give us a right interpretation of the law. To understand that sometimes the right thing is the wrong thing to do. Because sometimes those wrong things that you do are the right thing at that time. Sometimes you have to set aside what's right for compassion, for the good of that person that you're creating that side path for. Jesus was saying, it's all about compassion. It's all about how we are to help others around us. <clears throat> I just got back from, from annual conference, uh, and for you that don't know what annual conference is, it's a, it's a gathering of, <clears throat> of all the church representatives in the Susquehanna uh, co Conference. The Susquehanna Conference uh, encompasses, I'm not sure exactly how many churches, um, but we were at the Hershey uh, Lodge um, for the last three days, and there was enough people to fill... Um, I'm saying six or seven of these sanctuaries. Okay, so there's a bunch of people. Probably over a thousand. I don't know the number, but I'm sure it was, it had to be that many. And what they do at annual conference is vote on stuff uh, that affects the church. That happens every year. Every four years, they have what is called a, con uh, a general conference. And a general conference brings together representatives from all over the United Methodist system. From Africa, from, uh, from Asia, from all Canada, everywhere. Everywhere there's a United Methodist church, they send representatives, the conferences send representatives to the general conference. Over the past decade, there's been a big question about human sexuality. And the United Methodist Church has done its best to, to kind of put that off to the side and, and see if it would care for itself, but it has not. It has become a, a, a big issue in the United Methodist Church, and in fact, <clears throat> Some feel that it may even cause a rift in the United Methodist system. Because there are two sides to this story. And both sides is very... <sighs> can't think of the word I want to use. But each side brings scripture to the discussion. And their side is right. This is the right thing to do. This is my way is the right thing to do. And there has become hostility 
between the two groups. And so, at the last general conference, they knew that they could no longer not address this anymore. And so, the bishops got together and says, okay, we're going we're gonna to form a committee. And in, in uh, 2019, and I think it's February, I think, I think it's February 2019, that they are going to call a special general conference, especially to, to deal with this issue. What they have come, what the bishops have said that they are going to uh, uh, back, what they're going to endorse, if you will. There was three plans that this commission came up with. And the one that the, the bishops will be uh, promoting, uh, will be, you know, um, putting forth towards the general conference, is a, a plan called One Church. The One Church Plan. I'm not versed well in what all that means. But this I do know. If... This plan, the One Church Plan, is ratified by the General Conference. It will change the language in what we call the Book of Discipline. The Book of Discipline is the guidelines that United Methodists go by as they go forward. That One Church Plan will change the language in that discipline and allow a gay, lesbian, all, the, all those initials that I can never remember, but because it doesn't matter to me, but they will, that will be taken away. And they won't be allowed to be ordained as elders in the system. And the um, churches will be uh, able to allow same-sex marriages within the walls of their church. It will also change the wording in the discipline uh, to protect, if you will, those churches that don't feel they want to allow same-sex marriages. It's going to allow room for the pastors to choose for themselves whether they will or will not perform same-sex marriages. So what that boils down to and why it is why I bring it forth today in this context of Jesus coming forth about working on the Sabbath is because it sounds to me like each church, each congregation, each community of faith is going to be asked to make a decision. They're going to be asked to make a decision to exclude or include, to allow or disallow. And why do I bring forth it today? We can bring scripture forth to support each side of this, this debate. It's already been done. But is it God's intention that we make a decision because we're right? Or will it be out of compassion that we make a decision? Will we make a decision because God wants us to include everyone because we're all God's children? Or do we make a decision that says, well, I don't think so. And it will become very challenging for each congregation. Because this is a very personal issue. There are some that will be sitting in the, in the, in the, in the pews and, and making discussion and, and conversation that have family members that are in that group. 
And how do we say to them, their children aren't like our children, they're not as good because... I'm not asking, and I'm not promoting anything today, because I don't feel that I can judge. Because I don't want my life judged because, man, <laughs> Ed Ziders is, uh, he's a reverend, reverend doctor, uh, Edwin Ziders. Um, he's a, just a, a godly man, uh, just a, and I highly regard uh, him as an individual and as uh, a pastor. And uh, in part of the uh, annual conference, he wrote a, 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 an article and about making all things new, uh, and it's entitled Reflections of Our Spiritual Imaginations. He's talking about um, Paul's message where it says, in, in um, everything to be needed to be rethought when the resurrection of Christ came and reframed, in Christ all things are made new. And then he continues on here, and I think this is the part I want you to hear. Newness of life, personally and corporately, is precisely why we organize ourselves into congregations, agencies, and connectional church. Newness is our mandate and our work. When we proclaim the liberating love and mercy of God, we are expected to embrace it all with joy and humility. But there is more, so much more. Together we are to be evidence of that love and mercy. Together we are to live before the world and with each other as new people. What can that mean? That our old behaviors and contrivances must pass away. Our rhetoric of goodness and mercy must be accompanied with the evidence of our transformed common life together. If we intend to reveal to the world that which has shaped us and formed us, then the measure of our effectiveness is rooted in the moral implications of that newness. When we say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, is certainly a witness to the powering and renewing love of God. But our lives and partnerships, our decisions and actions are intended to be the light shining in the darkness. That is the joy of newness. Personally, and together we reveal the new things unfolding and the old things passing away. Lord, let it be so. End of quote. It is a newness. When we accept Christ, we are made new. And all things pass away. Christ is compassion and mercy and grace. And I'm very grateful for that. None of that do I deserve, but it is offered freely. Jesus was about compassion that day. The law was good, but compassion trumped the law. And he asked that man to stretch out his hand. And in so doing, his hand was restored. It will not be an easy road. And newness isn't easily... accepted but Christ came to be new and we celebrate that fact today 